Rodeus approach Sterling 105. We're downwind from runway 30 and something's glowing on the field. Looks like a fire. Come on, come on! After the initial impact, the KLM continues flying for another 150 meters before slamming into the ground. The 55 tons of fuel the Dutch plane had taken on creates a massive fireball that seals the fate of everyone on board. Not one person survives. Fire crews don't immediately realize that there is another plane hidden in the fog. For 20 long minutes, the Pan Am passengers are left to fend for themselves. And there was absolutely nothing you could do to help because the airplane was collapsing in on people. When I got out on the ground, I could hear people screaming and yelling and all. Within about five minutes, you heard absolutely nothing. There was no noise at all, just the, air, the airplane burning. My husband was sitting to my right, and, and I undid his seatbelt and kind of pushed him out of his seat to get him moving. And we headed for the door and it was engulfed in flames and there was no way to exit that way later spanish authorities set up a morgue in one of the hangars 583 people died even today it's still the highest death toll of any aviation disaster and soon everyone began asking the same questions how and why could two state-of-the-art airliners smash into each other on the same runway. Investigators from the US, the Netherlands, and Spain slowly pieced together the improbable chain of coincidences, bad luck, and questionable judgment that led to the accident. They recognized that the bomb, the overcrowded airport, and the bad weather were all unavoidable. The investigators agreed that pilot error was the cause of the accident. But the teams disagreed about how to apportion blame. The Dutch complained that the controllers in the tower used non-standard terminology. The Spanish and American investigators acknowledged that the Pan Am mistake played a role, but they held that the main fault lay with the KLM crew because there was one undeniable fact. We're, now We're going. Captain Van Zanten took off without proper clearance from the tower. The burning question was, why? The answer revealed a systemic problem that plagued cockpits throughout the aviation industry. None of the subordinate crew members had the authority to shut down the takeoff, had the authority to tell the captain something the captain didn't want to hear. The critical turning point came just 67 seconds before the collision. That's when, according to the KLM data and voice recorders, Captain Van Zanten first applied power to the engines. First Officer Muirs quickly reminded him that they had not yet received air traffic clearance. This was an almost unthinkable error for an experienced pilot to make. The tower then relayed to KLM an ATC clearance, which is not the same as permission to take off. What happened next stunned investigators. Captain Van Zanten repeated his earlier mistake and began to apply power again. And this time, no one spoke up. As they began their takeoff roll, the collision might yet have been averted, if not for a terrible piece of bad luck. First Officer Mirrors told the tower that they were beginning their roll. The tower told them to stand by. At the same time, the Pan Am cockpit warned that they were still on the runway. In the KLM cockpit, these simultaneous transmissions were audible, but barely. It's possible that Van Zanten didn't hear either message, although the KLM flight engineer appeared to react to it. Isn't you clear then? What do you say? Isn't you clear the Pan Am? Oh, yes. Those are the last clear words on the KLM voice recorder. The data recorder, though, suggested that Captain Van Zanten quickly realized that he was on a collision course because he tried to take off early. 
The airplane is accelerating uh, rapidly during the takeoff roll, and uh, it's covering hundreds of feet per second, so that by the time he saw it, there was no hope that he was going to be able to stop in time to avoid the collision. That only left him the possibility of trying to fly over the top of it. And as he rotated uh, to try to get the, the 747 airborne at the earliest possible moment, uh, it struck the tail and, and there was impact uh, marks on the runway. They only had three or four seconds to sort it out. Today, 30 years later, cockpit culture is very different. Pilots are trained not only to tolerate input from other members of the crew, but to encourage it. Because of those concerns, the FAA is now experimenting with an improved system that warns pilots directly of possible runway conflicts. Embedded in one runway at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, Sets of bright red signals act as a kind of smart traffic light for aircraft. When a runway is in use, the airport's movement tracking system automatically switches on red holding lights to warn taxiing pilots not to cross onto the active strip. Meanwhile, fewer than 10% of the nation's increasingly crowded airports have any kind of movement detection system at all. And the NTSB has warned the FAA that the yearly number of incursions is simply too high. Too long are we dealing with issues like 325 runway incursions a year. We must begin the process of bringing those numbers down. We've been lucky too long. I don't believe our luck can hold out. 